Hello, everybody, and I'd like to welcome you to kind of an impromptu uh, Q&A session I've set up here with uh, none other than uh, Rick Rule of Rule Investment Media, formerly uh, Sprott U.S. Holdings. Uh, I think you all know Rick. I don't need, really need to give him an introduction, but the, the man has been working in the security space and the natural resources space for 50 years now. Um, and I'm hoping that we can tap into a little bit of that knowledge and experience and get some of his thoughts on uh, some of his favorite commodities here as we uh, start 2024. So welcome, Rick. Thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to spend a little time with us. Uh, thanks so much for having me back. I was sort of thinking when the invitation came through that I had been having fruitful discussions with one member or another of the Chekin family for three decades of the five decades that I've been in this business. So I'm delighted. Uh, I'm delighted to be on with the second generation. Well, appreciate that. And, and always happy to have a conversation with you because you, you bring so much important information that I know our readers, our listeners, or our clients are going to love to hear. And, and I'd like to get right into it. Um, right now, in your opinion, what is your favorite uh, natural resource and why? Uh, I need to give you three answers, unfortunately, and then I'll cut it back. My favorite natural resource over time has always been water. Uh, but sadly, uh, as a bad quip, water is illiquid. There are not very many investment vehicles that the average investor can utilize to participate in the water business, other than perfecting his or her access to whatever water they might need to sustain their current lifestyle or business, which is a different discussion. Uh, I would need to say for most investors in North America that North American natural gas is the most underpriced, undervalued uh, resource out there. It produces a byproduct, of course, of oil. And the oil drilling that we're seeing in the Permian Basin, as an example, has created a temporary oversupply of natural gas, which is weighing on gas prices and weighing on gas companies' prospects. But the price differential... Uh, between sort of $2.25 per million BTU in West Texas uh, and eight or $9 per million BTU delivered in Tokyo, Shanghai, uh, or Rotterdam is too great an arbitrage uh, to ignore. The consequence of that is that the industry is spending billions of dollars building, gathering infrastructure, transmission infrastructure, processing infrastructure, liquefied natural gas infrastructure. Such a good business, in fact, that the president, uh, Biden, had to come out against it last week. I, I guess it's just too great an opportunity for Americans for either Mr. Biden or Mr. Trudeau to stomach. We but can't, we can't let progress get in the way, right? Right. I would say that North American natural gas is probably in the five-year time frame the best investment opportunity in resources that faces North Americans. But I'm going to pull a bit of a fast one on you, uh, Rich, uh, and say for your audience that... I think there's real upside in gold. Uh, and a, a year from now, a year and a half from now, probably greater upside in the silver stocks. It, it's interesting when people talk about gold, how compressed their time frames are. Uh, people asked me in one of my own Q&As a couple of weeks ago when I thought the gold price might move. And, and I mentioned that I, day. Be I, I began to... Uh, I began to add to my bullion holdings in 1998. And I would suggest to you that the gold, uh, gold began to move in the year 2000. Uh, as I recall, it was $256. It's about 2000 now. That's 8% compound return uh, in 23 years. In other words, gold is already moving. The people's expectation of what constitutes a gold move uh, are expectations that were conditioned on the, dec on the decade of the 70s and the decade 2000 to 2010. And by the way, I'm not ruling out a big move. Uh, I am particularly attracted to the fact that gold has disappointed so many investors. That's why I like it. Uh, what would make me turn bearish? Oh, I guess a balanced budget, the end of quantitative easing, the reduction of the on-balance sheet and off-balance sheet liabilities of the U.S. federal government below $150 trillion. I don't see any of those things occurring. And I need to say, before I talk about the investment attributes, uh, Rich, that I don't care at all about a move in the gold price from $2,000 to 2200 or 2500 To me, that's background noise. That's keeping pace with inflation. 
I own gold because I'm afraid that it's going to go to 8,000 or 9,000. If that sounds outlandish, remember the people had given up on hope on gold in the year 2000 at $250. At the end of the decade, it was at $1,900. You own gold because of the probability, or pardon me, the possibility of hyperbolic moves. You can't say when, but the fact that it's so deeply out of favor makes me attracted. And let me leave, let me, let me give you a statistic, uh, Richard, that I, I'm almost sure that your listeners haven't paid attention to. The market share of precious metals and precious metals related investments in the United States is less than one half of 1%, which means that precious metals assets comprise less than one half of 1% of the total savings and investment assets held by Americans. Despite the fact that gold is important to you, most people can't spell it. The four decade mean market share of precious metals is 2%. So gold doesn't have to win the war against the U.S. dollar. Gold doesn't have to defeat the treasury. All it has to do is revert to mean. If it reverts to mean, which I think it will do within five years, you will quadruple demand for precious metals and precious metals-related assets in a market that comprises 22% of the global market for savings and investments. That's precisely what I think will happen. What is my ultimate price target? I'm not smart enough to give you one. I know that prices are set on the margin. And I know that in a commodity where prices are set on the margin, if you quadruple demand, it can have a really interesting impact on price. Now, partially, this might be uh, self-correcting, uh, which is to say, although history doesn't tell us this, that an increase in the gold price would constrain demand. My own experience is, perversely, that people don't want to own it when it's cheap, <laughs> and the price rise validates the narrative when it's dear. Suffice it to say, my dark horse candidate uh, for uh, commodities-related investment for uh, 2024 is definitely gold and gold stocks. And for 2025, because gold usually leads the bull market, but then silver follows, I think for 2025, 2026, I'd have to say silver and silver stocks. Yeah, I tend to agree. And, and, you know, you've made a lot of money over the years being a contrarian, and I'm 100% with you. I hear all the time that people are saying that, you know, I'm not going to buy gold because gold is at its all-time highs. It's too expensive. And, you know, I look at the charts. I look at the, the market movement. I know the client behavior. I know that we've been consolidating here at 2000 for years. Um, this, to me, is not the end of the leg up. It's the start of the next leg up. Uh, am, I, am I off base there? No, but I would point out something else. When people say it's at all-time highs, they are not talking in inflation-adjusted dollars. Good point. Uh, if you measure this against a prior high at 1950, you know, what, 14 years ago? Yeah. Remember the compound deterioration of the value of the denominator. You're denominating it in U.S. dollars. And by the way, I would suggest that your listeners, when they look at the impact of inflation, don't consider the CPI. Uh, I don't think that the real inflation rate is anything like 2.8%. Among other things, check this out. The CPI doesn't include tax. As a cost of living index, to ignore the largest component of household expenses is farcical. Uh, I believe myself, and I'm an old fat rich guy, I don't spend any money. Uh, I believe that the deterioration of the purchasing power of my dollar is more like 7%. So the idea that my purchasing power is deteriorating at between 5 and 7% compounded, and juxtaposing that with the statement that gold is at an all-time high, would suggest a deficiency in arithmetic. Yeah, 100% agree. Um, and you already kind of touched, I was going to ask about silver, but just a quick follow-up, and I agree with you, you know, gold is the leader in the, in the complex. It tends to start the move either up or down, and then silver tends to follow and outpaces you throw into the mix the, the increased consumption of silver for all these wonderful green projects that probably are never going to work, but they're still going to consume silver. Um, and you look at the fact that in the past two years, I think it was, we've basically eliminated uh, an oversupply uh, that was built up for the previous 11. I got to think I agree with you that silver's day is coming. 
you know, I need to say that in terms of my physical holdings, they're overwhelmingly gold because my physical goes to address my fear. <laughs> and I, I consider silver uh, to be more speculative than gold. My experience has been uh, over 50 years now, sadly, <laughs> that the momentum is established by gold. Uh, and when the precious metals narrative takes hold, then silver moves further and faster. And what you say about the emerging demand for silver, I think needs to be reiterated. Uh, some of the green initiatives, which is to say solar power, do work in places where the sun shines. Uh, the problem with solar is that they try it in Germany where the sun doesn't shine. But in places like Calexico, California, or, or, or Phoenix, or, or any place between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Cancer, uh, Capricorn, uh, solar works well. And without silver, you don't have silver. Uh, pardon me, solar. The reflective properties of, uh, of silver are centerfold. But what people need to understand around silver is the increasing use in water treatment, sewerage treatment, uh, and as a germicide. The germicidal properties of silver exactly. yep. are incredibly important. And silver utilization uh, in those health-related capacities is the biggest non uh, solar use of silver. It The World Silver Institute suggests that uh, about 1.2 billion ounces of silver will be used in fabrication this year. Some amount of that uh, can be obviously recovered through recycling, but an important uh, component can't be recovered through recycling. And then finally, the dark horse around silver is that so much silver is produced as a byproduct of copper, lead, and zinc production. Uh, and at least in the copper space, the investment that society has made in new copper mines has lagged for 30 years. What that means is that over five years, the byproduct silver production from right. copper, lead, and zinc mines will inevitably drop. Yeah. yeah, there's no question. It's very inelastic. You can't just push a button and say, let's get more silver. You need something else more to get more silver. That's, right. a, that's a good point. Uh, I'm going to switch gears here a little bit. Um, you have to have your head in the ground if you don't know that everything's going berserk in the Middle East and around the world. Um, that's having some serious implications on oil prices. Uh, and uh, just want to get your thoughts on on where you think oil prices might go, because that has, that has a big impact. You know, we talk about inflation. Um, if oil prices continue to climb, uh, forget about inflation going down when when you need oil to get every product on earth to market. Uh, so where do you where do you think oil prices are going, given the tensions? Uh, I don't okay. think they need to go higher. Uh, I think they could go higher on fears of geo geopolitical risk. Uh, I think the cost associated with shipping oil uh, will temporarily be higher yep. because of the closure of the Red Sea uh, as a consequence of those geopolitical hostilities. What's more important to understand about oil is that because of the official sector's hostility to oil, uh, the cost of capital for oil companies has gone higher. Big institutional investors have been pressured to disinvest from oil. And the consequence of that is that the oil industry, including state-controlled firms, is under-investing and sustaining capital to the tune of about a billion U.S. dollars per day. The industry is under-investing and sustaining capital expenditures in excess of $360 billion a year. That doesn't impact production six months out, but it does impact production two years out and three years out. If you look at what a decade of underinvestment has done by the Venezuelan National Oil Company, PDVSA, or the Mexican National Oil Company, Pemex, what you will see is that systemic underinvestment in new project and sustaining capital investments has real impacts in production. Both of those companies, state-controlled companies, have seen 60 or 70% production declines. Uh, over the course of a couple decades as a consequence of systemic underinvestment. And you're seeing systemic underinvestment occur around the world. Okay. It's important to note that at US 70, $75 oil, the oil companies are making tons of money. This is a high enough price for the investment thesis to work because the market is valuing those earnings as though they were going to disappear in 2030 because the big thinkers, 
you know, those guys who fly 1,200 private jets to Davos to tell yeah, you. They're all leaving demands. Davos. I wish they just locked them up there. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I, those guys tell you that peak oil demand occurs in 2030 or 2032, which is ridiculous. How will they get to Davos? Exactly. Uh, it's all over then. You know, peak oil demand occurs in 2065. And this continuous underinvestment in sustaining capital means that the price will stay higher as a consequence of production declines for longer. So the trick is simply to find oil companies that are making the sustaining capital investments to maintain their production uh, while rewarding shareholders and just sit back and enjoy the ride. Uh, this is silly. And by the way, you don't need to come way down the quality trail. Start with the biggest and the finest capital allocator in the space, Exxon. Exxon is making sustaining capital investments. They have a discovery in Guyana that is so big that it moves the dial for a company the size of Exxon. Rather than scrimping on sustaining capital investments, they bought Pioneer for $60 billion and they're making so much money that they're going to increase the return of capital to shareholders by stock buybacks and dividends by 14% in 2024. This is really, really, really simple stuff if you ignore the popular media and if your investment horizon extends past a quarter. Very good, very good. Um, let me ask you this. If, is there any other alternative that you like to oil, to dinosaur juice, if you will? Well, the other dinosaur juice, natural gas. <laughs> uh, okay. North American yeah. natural gas is even cheaper uh, because of the overproduction of natural gas uh, in the Permian Basin. And gotcha. the price discrepancy, as we talked before, uh, between hydrocarbons in West Texas and hydrocarbons on world markets is stupidly broad. And it will be addressed over five years. It absolutely positively will be addressed. Now, there are commodities that in 2025 or 2026, uh, I think will be attractive. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of the commodities that the Russians are selling on world markets now, nickel, platinum, and palladium. Uh, I, I've seen this before. The last time Russia was broke, 90 and 91, they emptied the cupboards uh, and they trashed these commodity prices. Uh, and when the Russians ran out of inventory and the selling pressure ceased, the commodities bounced back. Uh, nickel is also depressed because of lateritic nickel production uh, in Sulawesi in Indonesia. And I think the environmental degradation associated with that, and by the way, I'm, I would not describe myself as a bleeding heart, but I just flew over those nickel fields a month ago and the environmental devastation is appalling. At any rate, if you're looking further out, two or three years out, the other commodities that people hate are platinum, palladium, and nickel. And I think they'll do very well. But I don't think you need to position yourself in 2024 for that. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time. I know your time is valuable, but I've got one more question to ask because I'm, I'm going to be joining you again this year. And I'm really looking forward to it, especially now when I, I, I try to play a round of golf and, you know, in the snow covered fields here in Maryland. I'm thinking about Boca Raton in Florida, and I, I know you've got a little something going on July 7th through the 11th, uh, where you're, you're going to bring together a whole bunch of experts. You're obviously going to be there as well as the host uh, and, and get a lot of airtime talking about these issues and others. Um, why should the people listening to this video right now come join us in Boca Raton this year more than ever? Well, the first reason is, unlike any other investment conference in the world, this one comes with a gold-plated money-back guarantee. If you don't feel you got your money's worth for any reason, either attending live in Boca Raton or uh, virtually at the streaming event from the, from the comfort of your own home, email me and I will return you your money. There is no other conference sponsor in the world that has the confidence and the courage to say to people, the financial risk is all mine. Repeat, all mine. Now, why could I make that guarantee? This may be the 30th year that we've done this conference. Uh, may not be, maybe the 29th, but at any rate, this conference has stood the test of time. With the exception of the New Orleans conference, another fine conference, uh, this is the longest running uh, uh, retail natural resource investment conference on the planet. Uh, what do we do? We bring you wonderful big picture thinkers, Nomi Prince, Daniela DiMartino Booth, pardon me, uh, 
uh, Jim Rickards, uh, wonderful big picture guys, Bill Bonner, uh, people who talk about the way the world really is, not the way that the folks in Davos or, or uh, you know, in the New York Times think it is. And then uh, once we've helped you shape your view of global macro, we have some of the best focused analysts and editors in the natural resource investing space to help you craft in real time portfolios that take advantage of the new understanding that you get as a consequence of global macro. Beyond that, uh, we have what we call the living legends, uh, a group of entrepreneurs who have built multi-billion dollar natural resource companies from scratch, from a standing start, not just thumping their chest about what they did, but rather telling you how they did it, what lessons they learned, and how those lessons made them better investors. This is really, truly where the rubber meets the road. These guys aren't analysts. These are guys who have done it. Importantly, too, there will be about 60 exhibitors there, uh, and every exhibitor will be, in the case of bullion dealers, as an example, people with whom we have done business for 30 years without a single customer complaint. Any customer complaints, as you know from last year's event, they're thanked and excused. Uh, and in terms of the public companies, every public company exhibitor has to be owned in my accounts or accounts that I advise. Sadly, Rich, the fact that I own a company doesn't mean that the share price goes up. But what it does mean is that we have vetted every single exhibitor. We know them well enough that we own them. Attendees have told us for years and years and years that the exhibitors are content. They aren't just advertisers. And the consequence of that is that our uh, representation to the attendees is that every single exhibitor has the explicit endorsement of the dais. There is no other investment conference on the planet that gives you this sort of rounded sense of natural resources and precious metals investing. A no investment conference that I know of in the world that has a gold-plated money-back guarantee. Oh, one more thing. July in August, pardon me, Ju uh, July in Florida uh, is hot. Yeah. Let's get through that. Uh, the consequence of that is that with the conference held at a resort that Michael Dell now has a billion four in uh, is spectacular. Rooms that right now would rent for $1,100 a night uh, were able to turn for $300 a night. Amazing, yeah. The conference facility, you saw it. Yep. It's enormous and it is spectacular. It's the easiest place to put on a high quality conference that I've ever seen in my life because so much money has been spent on the facility. And then finally, despite the fact that we work your behind off all day, yep. at night, uh, things are a little different. We have a wonderful boat cruise on the Intercoastal Canal uh, where your liquor bill goes on my tab. And finally, beyond that, whether you attend live or virtually, you will have access to the conference recordings for a year after the conference. It is absolutely impossible attending this event 12 hours a day, four straight days, that you can absorb all of the information that would be of benefit to you. And having the ability to review the tapes, I've reviewed last year's Boca tapes three times, despite the fact that I put on the conference. Uh, really, truly, Rich, you've learned this. You get out of something what you put into it. And we're going to give you the opportunity to put in and get out a lot. I can just back everything Rick just said up 100%. I witnessed it firsthand. I saw it in Vancouver, saw it again last year in Boca. Um, I have not run into a single attendee or exhibitor and speaker for that matter that didn't think it was an amazing event that they got something out of. You know, So the people that were there to educate got educated. Um, and uh, I, I think it's something you want to be a part of if you want to join us, and I encourage you to do so. Um, below uh, this uh, email, you're going to see a little bit of a link. Uh, all you have to do is click it, register. Um, you're not full up yet, right? You're still taking new people? Absolutely, positively. 
fantastic. So uh, go ahead and register, sign up. We love to see you down in Boca uh, in July. And uh, Rick, again, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule, sharing your thoughts with our listeners. Uh, I know they got something out of this today. So thank you. Well, thank you. And thank the Chechen family for your support of our efforts uh, over the last 30 years. It means a lot to us. Thank you. We love being associated with great people. And you are that. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye now.